Hi guys, it's Ross Hodinot from NatureTTL.com and I'm here today to help you take great photographs of woodland. I've decided to come to Woodland today because the weather isn't particularly good, it's a bit drizzly, it's overcast, and Woodland's a really good place to go to take photographs on a, a fairly rubbish day, weather's not great, come into to the shelter of some Woodland and hopefully I can photograph. There's, there's a really nice river here, so I'm hoping to photograph the river. There's some seasonal colours starting to appear, so I'm hoping to shoot those as well. I'm hoping to find some fungi and, and perhaps some other kind of textures and patterns. Um, so, fingers crossed, we're going to have a little explore now and we'll see what we can find and what we can photograph. I think this is a really nice spot along the river. I'm a bit concerned about some of this kind of debris in the background here. I think that really ruins the shot, but the viewpoint looking in this direction is really nice. There's a few autumnal leaves in the foreground, which I might decide to incorporate into the shot, but I definitely think there's real potential for a nice image here. Possibly using a polarizing filter to kind of give the colors a bit more intensity, and also maybe using an ND filter just to give the water motion just a little bit of kind of creative blur. So I'm going to set up now. So the river looks fantastic here. And this is my initial composition. I've decided to use the foreground rocks to give a little bit of a frame. I also quite like the fact there's some autumnal leaves here in the foreground, which I think is, is kind of quite attractive and makes it look quite seasonal. Um, I've deliberately, as you can see from this shot, I've intentionally obscured the sky. I don't want any white sky coming right into the shot. So if I just alter this, and you can see some kind of white highlights coming into the, uh, into the upper part of the shot. And, and they will burn out and they look really distracting. So when you photograph woodland on overcast days, ideally try and exclude the sky and make sure that the frame is filled up with just woodland and, and, and that will reduce the contrast and make it a lot easier to get a very nice shot. I've just attached uh, a polarizing filter. I used uh, Lee Filter's landscape polarizing filter. And the reason why I've done that is because polarizers are great for woodland interiors. Most people think of polarizers as just being good for blue skies and, and kind of big open vistas. But polarizers reduce all the glare and reflections coming off water and foliage. And so for a scene like this, it does a really good job at giving, giving the scene more punch, giving the colors more vibrancy. This is the unpolarized scene at the minute. And just as I rotate the filter, you'll see that the colors really start to intensify and the contrast within the moving water becomes much greater. The image looks far better now with this filter and if you're going to go out and shoot woodland, I would really recommend that you bring your polarizer with you. In this instance, I'm using the leaves and this kind of rocky ledge as my foreground interest. But a scene like this doesn't have to have foreground. I think a lot of photographers get really hung up on always having foreground interest. And river scenes can look great with a fallen tree or rocky boulders in, in the foreground just to add that little bit of interest. But when you shoot in water motion, that water motion itself can create that really nice kind of foreground interest. And sometimes that's all you need. You probably notice that with my shot that I'm shooting upstream with the, with the kind of water running in towards the camera, which I think in this instance works really, really well. But don't worry too much about whether you're shooting upstream or downstream. Rivers are really good at creating a natural lead in line. So whichever direction you shoot in, the river's going to direct the eye through the image and create a really kind of deep, compelling composition. Another good technique to try on a day like today when it's damp and a little bit miserable is to try intentional camera motion or ICM as, as people often describe it. And this is a technique where you move the camera, you drag the camera during the exposure to blur subject detail, subject motion, that's what you're kind of creating. Now I've come to this particular spot here, this, this group of trees in, in front of me, because I'm looking for strong structure. So when you intentionally blur your subject, you're looking for a subject that has got really good structure to it, strong bold shapes, there's texture, there's contrast, so that when you kind of create that motion, the image actually still has really good definition and interest. So for ICM images, it's quite a good idea to actually use a tripod, um, but you can shoot them handheld. 
it's not an issue. Um, different, different heads work in different ways. This tripod head isn't the best for this. It's a, it's a, a geared head and it creates a little bit, it's a little bit jerky to actually move up and down. Possibly a ball and socket head would produce uh, a slightly more kind of flowing motion. But whatever you decide to use, it's just a matter of trial and error. Try different lengths of exposure and also just vary the actual speed that you move the camera. And those, those things will all create different looking results. One of the big considerations when shooting ICM images is, is shutter length. You need a relatively long exposure in order to get the creative level of motion that you're, you're, you're trying to achieve. I would say an exposure time of around a second to two seconds is a really good starting point. So you can achieve that with a low ISO. You could also select a very small aperture. You don't need to worry about diffraction at all when you're taking these kind of images because obviously they're soft anyway. Um, and you could use a, a solid ND filter to help create that long level of exposure. I've got a polarizing filter on at the minute because that's absorbing a couple of stops of light. It's also saturating the colors, which is making my images look a little bit more saturated as well. One of the first things that comes to mind when you think autumn is all the lovely autumnal colours. But you have to be really careful that auto white balance doesn't try and neutralise them. I recommend you shoot on one of your presets like daylight or cloudy. And you could actually use one of the presets to deliberately saturate the colours slightly more. Cloudy and shade are both really good at just giving your shots a little bit of extra warmth. The other subject that you really think of when you think of autumn is fungi. And that's what we're going to go and look for now. and it looks like we've found the perfect subject. There's some really nice groups of uh, toadstools here, but they're a bit chaotic, there's a lot going on, so I'm actually looking to find just one or two um, that are growing kind of slightly more separately from the others, which I can isolate and, and hopefully make a, a kind of a simpler, kind of nicer composition from them. And often it is better to go for small groups than it is to go for obvious large masses. I found my subject, it's in pristine condition, and now I've set up my tripod to give me stability. There's not a lot of light obviously in the woodland today, so I need the tripod, tripod to give me not only stability, but also it allows me to fine tune my composition. In terms of composition, I've gone for a fairly low angle because that generally looks more intimate, it looks more natural, um, and often with fungi, a low worm's eye view when you're looking up at it can, can look really nice. I've just isolated the one mushroom um, the other ones are kind of out of focus around it. I'm going to use a, a relatively shallow depth of field to achieve that. And the fungus is, is just kind of on an intersecting third, which is a really kind of nice striking place for, for, the, for the subject to be. So now having set up, I've got two things I really need to think about, my focusing and also lighting. With focusing, I always favour live view. It is great for really precisely apply my focus. So what I can do is with the live view um, activated on my screen, um, I can just zoom in and then manually adjust my focus. I can do this with great precision. Generally with close-up subjects, it is better to focus manually. Um, you have more precision. Autofocus can sometimes hunt around um, for, for focus on small subjects shot at high magnification. And I'm just very, very finely adjusting focus so that it's placed just on the edge of the cap and um, having done that, I'm going to zoom back out. It's all nice and sharp, and I'm ready to take my photograph. I'm really pleased with it. The shot works very nicely. I think the, uh, the toadstool standing out really well from its kind of out of focus foreground and background. So I'm, I'm happy from that perspective, but the image does look a bit flat, which is hardly surprising. The light is very flat. Um, that you know it's, it's overcast and there's a, a very dense leaf canopy above. So in order to try and give the image just a bit more drama I'm going to apply a little bit of artificial lighting and to do that I'm going to use this LED. Uh, the one I use is made by Manfrotto but there are all kinds of versions available and the nice thing about using a constant light source like this is that you can be very creative you can kind of move the LED around the subject to kind of get different effects I've always liked backlighting the most, so I'm just going to turn this LED on now and I'm going to just hand hold it behind my subject 
and obviously I'm just regulating the effect by either moving it closer or further away and just looking at the effect on the screen of my camera. I'm happy with that and suddenly I've got an image with a lot more interest and impact. Another really good lighting accessory for close-ups is a reflector. Um, in these kind of dark conditions, just having a little bit of natural light reflected up on your subject can just relieve very dark shadow areas and just create a really kind of nice natural looking light. A small version like this, this one's made by Lazolite, is ideal and perfect accessory to kind of keep in your backpack when you shoot woodland close-ups. So there you have it, three really neat ways to take great shots in Woodland on an overcast day. I hope you've enjoyed this video and don't forget to hit subscribe to Nature TTL for more interesting and great videos every week. Subscribe for more and don't forget to check the description for links to all the gear used in this video.